Hello and welcome to Six Figure Authors, the show that helps you take your writing career to the next level. I'm Lindsay Baroker and I'm here with my two co-hosts. I'm Andrea Pearson. And I'm Joe Lalo. And we've got a great guest for you today, J.N. Cheney. He is a USA Today bestselling author of space opera and military science fiction and has a master's of fine arts and creative writing. He fancies himself quite the Super Mario Brothers fan, <laughs> currently lives in Las Vegas, and publishes a lot, both on his own and in collaborations, and he's also running a small press these days. So we're going to ask him all about how he markets his own books and also about publishing uh, other people's stuff. Welcome to the show, Jeff. Uh, JN. <laughs> yeah, I asked him before the show what he wanted to be called, and I still messed it up. So Glad to be here. Thank you. Well, why don't you tell us a little bit about how you got started in writing and publishing? Um, man, okay. Uh, well, I've been writing since I was 15. First story I ever wrote was on a yellow, um, one of those old yellow pad, you know, my mom had sitting around. Um, but it was a sci-fi story. But I didn't really want to be a writer until I, you know, I got to college and I couldn't decide what to be, you know. Um, I was undecided for a few years and then I was like, well, I, you know, I like to write, so I'll just do that. And uh, having no idea how I was going to make any money from it later. Um, but, yeah, I went to school for writing, joined the military, got a master's degree while I was in there for writing. And then um, it was after that that I was like, oh, I'm going to go indie and uh, self-publish this book that I've been working on. I used my thesis uh, for my master's degree, which is The Amber Project. It was the first book I put out. That took five years to write. Um, and then the sequel took a year. And then the one after that took six months. And the book after that took three months. So you know, as I was going, I was taking, um, you know, like how to market, how to write, or, you know, how to publish classes and, and uh, you know, those like Nick Stevenson's class and things like that, listening to podcasts like yours um, before it became Six Figure Authors and uh, learning as much as I could um, because that's what you have to do when you're self-published. You have to wear all these different hats. So the more that I learned, and I don't have any kids, you know, and I'm married, and at the time I was just living in a small little apartment um, and I was living off the savings that I had accumulated in the military. I'd saved up about $27,000 over four years, saved half my paychecks, knowing that after four years I was gonna get out and do this. Um, so I was planning ahead years in advance um, so that I would have this money to start this business. And um, I think I got down on my savings to like $1,800 before I started turning a profit and the income started going up, you know, in my savings. Um, but I took all that knowledge that I gained over the, over those first couple of years. And then I, um, I started co-writing with the agreement that I would handle the marketing, the cover design, you know, all these different things that I had learned about in this time. And I would, I still wouldn't call myself an expert on any of this stuff, but well informed enough to, you know, do well with it. And um, so I started co-writing with Jonathan Yanez and then Scott Moon and then Terry Maggard and, you know, basically my friends that I had made, you know, over the last, you know, couple of, first couple of years. And um, I would handle the marketing and, and the, uh, you know, I was writing to market at this point with Renegade Star and Orion Colony and, you know, The Last Reaper and stuff. Um, and then we would write the books together and do it like that. But I was also investing 90% of my income into um, building this audience up. And like I said, I had no kids, uh, I had no mortgage payments, nothing like that. So it was just more and more um, freedom to expand this business. And uh, it didn't start out intending to build a publisher. It just kind of happened. Um, I started out really just trying to build my own platform and um, I slowly brought in other people who I already knew and who I would talk to on the phone and we would come up with ideas for, you know, these projects in the Renegade universe. And then eventually um, just ideas that I had for the market that I thought would sell well, that I didn't have time to write myself. Um, and then eventually we had so many of these projects that I decided, okay, let's just make a publishing house. And that's how we got here. And, you know, now I handle advertising, cover design. Um, you know, we have, a, we have a set team in place. We have like 19 people that work in the company now. Um, we have a beta reader team of about 40 people. Um, it's just grown exponentially since we started. Um, and it's really all just out of necessity as we've 
expanded, you know, the writing team. So my sense of humor is all sorts of off, but would you say it cost all $27,000 to get started self-publishing? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I don't think so. Uh, oh, good. <laughs> really, that $27,000 was so that I didn't have to work a normal job for two years. Um, I agree with that, Lindsay. Lindsay just said she, she thought it was actually pretty good to live on that much for that long. That's a really good point. You're frugal, and especially since you were saving half of your checks while you were in the military. That's most, I mean, I dated a guy who was trying to do that, and he usually failed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, so in the military, when I, when I came in, they, they pay for everything, you know, so you really don't have to spend any money unless you're in debt. Um, I never went into debt for school. When I was going for my bachelor's degree, I worked as a maintenance porter uh, 60 hours a week um, you know, fixing the apartment complex where I lived. And I used that money to pay for several classes and do it that way without going, you know, without getting scholarships and without, um, going into debt, anything like that. But again, no kids, no mortgage, you know, you can do that when you're single and you don't have a lot of expenses. So I didn't buy clothes for like a year at a time, and things like that. I'm, I would walk around with holes in my shirt, pants and everything. Um, but because, you know, you prioritize the things that matter to you. And to me, my education mattered the most. And then later on, when I started my business, um, my books and becoming a writer, that was the only thing that mattered to me, like, at all. Like, I didn't care about dating. I didn't care about, um, you know, living well, uh, having the best food and the best clothes and having a nice place. Like, I just cared about publishing books and, you know, getting, becoming a writer. And I told myself, all I need is this amount of money. And I think it was like $1,200 a month. Though That'll fulfill all my basic needs, you know, the hierarchy and needs and all that. Um, if I can just get to that benchmark, I'll be okay. So my, for the first year, that was my only goal was to get to that benchmark. And then once I got there, I was like, okay, now I need to start saving money. So let's up $1,000 on top of that. And then it just kind of escalated from there. Um, but yeah, I think that's a big part of my success with publishing really came out of just planning ahead and, and prioritizing. Like I was working, I think at one point, like when I first started, I was working probably 80 hours a week, just writing. Like when I started Renegade Star, I should say, and that was, that was kind of when I kicked it into up to the next level, um, and stopped writing, like stopped releasing a book every six months and went to releasing a book every four to five weeks. Um, I was writing just eight hours, nine hours a day. And then I was spending another like six, seven hours researching marketing and cover art design and things like that. One of my really close friends who also edited my, you know, a lot of my books uh, for free at first. And he did the cover art for the, my first series for free. He's a uh, professional artist and I, I went to basic training with him. So that's how we know each other. Um, smartest guy I've ever met in my life and uh, very good to consult with when you're writing science fiction. Um, but he would teach me, you know, all these different design techniques. And uh, I would ask him all these questions like, you know, when you're designing a, a cover, like, what do you, what do you need to do to draw the eye? Like, what's the, you know, he taught me about the color wheel and he taught me about like, you know, the triangle and um, things like that with design and, um, and I've since gotten a lot better at implementing those things when I've worked with different artists. And that's the thing as a writer, like you can't really rely on your artist all the time to produce artwork. If they're not a professional cover artist, like you're bringing in art, you're bringing in artists from, you know, people that do concept art for video games and movies and stuff. They're not used to drawing something like a cover that's going to have typography on it because they're not doing the typography. You're hiring somebody else to do that. So you have to sort of act as, on top of a marketer and a, and a writer, uh, you also have to act as an art uh, director a lot of times if you want to get all these things right. And so that's, I also do that now too, but he taught me a lot of those things. So just, you have to wear a lot of hats in this and especially as a publisher, because I'm still writing, but now I'm doing all this other stuff too for other people. Yeah, no kidding. Um, okay, so would you say that having a, fine, a Master of Fine Arts has influenced your writing and style at all? Um, has it been worth it? And I, I get 
I mean, I hear a lot of authors that are saying, I should go get, you know, go get a degree in, in literary arts. I should go get a, you know, my master's. And I'm like, I don't know. So we're going to ask you, no. is it worth it? <laughs> no, it's a massive waste of money and time. Oh, I love it. <laughs> my no, you, brother-in-law would disagree, but. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, you know. Um, I, I agree with you though. <laughs> well, Lindsay, do you, do you have a master's of fine arts in uh, creative writing? Uh, I have a culture, literature, and arts degree, but I was actually asking when you were saying you were taking classes in the military. I remember I did the same thing and I had to show like my first sergeant the classes I was enrolled in. So I was wondering if you got any guff for taking like art stuff. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, so you were, were you in the Air Force? You said first sergeant. I was in the Army. Okay, yeah. So um, it, Air Force it, is a little different, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we have first sergeants, but it's a little bit different the, the way it works. Uh, first sergeants are more um in charge of like the airmen um like a lower rank e1 through e4 people that live in the dorms you know they do room inspections that sort of thing they're also in charge if you get in trouble you have to go to the first sergeant uh, but they're not like in charge of your shop necessarily that would be like you know a tech sergeant or a master sergeant something like that um but I, I i would have to do that with my immediate supervisor who was an e5 you know a staff sergeant and um, I would get ragged on all the time, you know, for going to school for writing. Uh, and you know how military people are. Uh, sometimes they're just like, oh, what are you doing this for? This is a waste of time. Like, don't do that. You're going to fail at this. But other people are really supportive. Like my actual first sergeant was extremely supportive. Awesome guy. But, you know, some people not so much. Um, but I don't think that those individuals necessarily saw the value of it, you know, because everybody hears about writing a book and they think that it's a pie in the sky dream. They don't quite understand the industry and how realistic it actually is if you're dedicated to it. So I was told by my immediate supervisor at the time, getting out of the military to be a writer is a terrible idea. Uh, you should stay in. This is the best job you're ever going to have. And if you get out, you're going to, you know, you're going to realize your mistake. Um, but of course, I had other people that were highly encouraging of that, you know, in the military, higher up, and also my peers um, who knew me better and knew the passion I had for this. Uh, but I think that's true of any, you know, any job. I, I've met a lot of people. I've worked with people, my co-writers and stuff, who have gone full time since working with me. And they got the same treatment at their jobs where they were like, are you sure you want to do this? Billy, are you sure you want to, you know, quit this job and walk away from this money to be a writer? Like, what is that? And I don't know. Just something about being an artist that people don't take seriously. Yeah, that's definitely true. I was working on a computer science degree at the time, so that was okay because I was signal. But uh, I do remember, it was probably the platoon sergeant or something. Somebody had to sign off because they paid for most of it, you know, if you took classes while you were in. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah but let's... Sorry, I was going to say, maybe we should move on to actually talking about your books a little bit. Um, you know, people may be curious. Uh, you recently published, it looked like the 14th book in your Renegade Star series that you started in 2017. Um, what are your thoughts on working on such a long series as far as marketing and keeping readers engaged? Um, it's exhausting, I'll tell you that. It's, uh, we've also got an expanded universe in this, and... Um, managing i have someone that's just in charge of the war right like i have an editor her name's molly and her whole job is oversight um and consistency management with this universe but just me writing these books i think we're at 14 now we've released 14 of them and we're going to end them at 16 and then i'm doing a prequel series called the renegade it's a lot of work um i don't recommend it unless your series is a runaway hit. Like if it's wildly successful and every book continues to sell better and better or at least the same, don't do a long series. Like try, like go six books, whatever you feel comfortable with um, because it's very difficult and tiring uh, after a while to keep the story interesting um, in the, you know, the same storyline, the same characters. Because you have to keep, you know, I, I try to give every book its own arc and I try to make it, each one stand out and be entirely unique from the rest. And that's, that's really difficult when you're writing the same story again and again and again or writing new entries in the same story. It's like, uh, like the new Star Wars movies, right? Like they couldn't, 
the new trilogy just kind of repeated the same, the same tropes of the originals, you know, with the, with the first few. And people complained a lot about that because they're like, well, we've already seen this before. So you're actively trying to avoid repeating yourself while coming up with new material that is, in, is equally engaging um, and keeps people interested. And that's, that's a hard balance to find. Like with every, every book in that series, I would try to add new character developments, new backstory, new, new twists. I would try to have like a new major battle scene that was different at its core from everything else. Like we had one battle scene where like someone slips into the center of a moon. And when you slip in, it destroys um, the area of the uh, like the slip portal, basically the opening. And so this, uh, the ship goes inside of a moon and then it expands its shields and blows the moon up. And like the uh, pieces of the moon um, act sort of like, like just debris that hits these other ships nearby. And so to make that realistic enough and make that work, like that was a lot of work, but it had never been done in the series before. Um, but we found a way to where it was satisfying. And that, having to do that every single book is very difficult after you get to 14 of them. And have you found that you've actually been publishing them pretty quickly, 2017, we're in 2020 and you've got 14 out, but have you had challenges with, uh, I've seen, you know, you've got a ton of reviews on book one, it's obviously sold very well, but have you had challenges with keeping it selling as you keep going with this long series or are the new books helping to keep people checking out the first one? Well, I think if you have good covers, you know, and you can, um, you have good reviews on the series. I think that um, a new release is bound to bring people back to book one. And if you release fast enough and maintain good quality, um, people will stay engaged. And so you'll spike in the store with a book 12, you know, and, um, and because of the cover art and the reviews, people will be drawn, new readers will be drawn back to the funnel of book one. But again, um, keeping people invested that long and so that you spike to like 200 in the store, 250 in the store, 130 in the store, like that's really hard to do. Um, but if you can do it, it's definitely worth it. Now you said that you're, we're, you know, we're at book 14 and you're going to be finishing off at book 16, right? Yeah. Uh, did you plan that from the, did you say I'm going to do a 16 book series? Like how much of the series did you plan uh, at the outset? Originally six books um, and that, you know, like we followed that plan and it, it got to the end. Um, that was the, the search for earth arc. And then after that, before that was even done, my editor and I, the guy that I told you about, he and I had mapped out potentially if this series is a success, if it's selling more books per release with book five and six than it did on books two and three, we'll keep it going with a new arc in this arc, you know, we playing that out and that's the celestial arc. Um, and then after that, we waited again and that was 12 books. And then we waited until we were close to that. And it's like, okay, is this still worth continuing or should we end it here? And it was worth continuing. And then I said, okay, one more arc to wrap everything up, escalation, um, lore, new lore, all this stuff. Um, 16 books felt about right. And that, and that, uh, was, that's as far as I feel comfortable going without, um, uh, what's the word milking the series to the point where it's just no longer like, it's just, okay, I'm reading the same book 30 times. Like, I don't want to do that. I think that's boring for me as a creative person. And it's boring for readers who at that point probably are just reading out of habit, you know, because they like the characters you want to you want to end a series where people still want more and, but it's also creatively satisfying for you as the author like you don't want to be writing this stuff and then it feels like like a like a a 9 to 5 job and you're like man I can't wait to get off so I can sit down and you know have a beer and and watch whatever on Netflix <laughs> like, like I want to I want to write because it's fun because that's that's Netflix you know yeah, we recently had an episode where we talked about staying motivated. And one of the things is if, you know, the passion for the project is, is evident in the project. And if you start to lose the passion, you start to put out substandard work. Uh, so you broke it into arcs. Uh, do the arcs work as, a, you know, new entry points or is everything funneling back to the first book in the series? 
Uh, no, it all funnels back. Um, I mean, I guess you could pick it up, but um, I wouldn't recommend it because like a lot of the, my favorite parts of the, of the series are flashbacks, um, character development scenes, um, when we're introduced to characters for the first time, getting to know them. You know, this is a very character driven series. And so for me, a lot of the fun comes from getting to know these people and then watching those uh, developments, you know, several books later pay off, you know, in the long term. So, yeah, I, I wouldn't recommend doing that. Okay, so we're going to, and I have a 10 book series and I lost, I was like, okay, that's the end of these characters. And then everybody was like, we want more from this character. So my next series was that character. And then the series after that was another character, but it's like, it's different enough for me to maintain interest, you know, and someday I'll probably put up this umbrella that says all of these belong to the same world universe, you know, but Right now, I'm just doing what I want to do. <laughs> um, okay, so we're going to transition to marketing now, I believe. Um, but my question for you, my first question here is, how do you handle your newsletter? Um, is it a necessary part of your marketing? Because I did see you had a newsletter sign up on your website. It's pretty prominent. Um, have you had one your whole career since you started writing? And if not, at what point did you send it up? Oh, man. Um, pretty early on, I think. Um, I don't think I had a newsletter for probably the first six months until my second or third book, you know, really came out because I was still learning things, but I had it well before Renegade Star hit. And, um, I mean, it was on my Facebook page. It was in the books. I put links in the books. Um, and then I think I eventually put it on the website probably within that first year. Um, but the marketing aspect of all that newsletter growth and everything was a big focal point for me um, starting out as I was learning the industry, as I think it is for a lot of people. Um, but it's easy to get sort of like wrapped up in that and really caught up in it where you're working on your sequencing and your funnel and everything, and then you're not writing your books. So it's important to, um, I, I would say do 70, 30, right? So 70% of your time focused on writing, if that's what, you're doing if you're not if you're self-published and you're handling all this yourself and then 30 percent of the time on marketing because nothing sells a book like releasing a book you know or a, selling a book one like releasing a book for you know so do you um i mean how often do you email is it just whenever you have a new release um do you do a um, you know a specific period where you email regardless or uh well we try to keep people engaged so we release um i release a book Every week. Every, every Sunday, sometimes twice a week on a Wednesday. Oh, a book? Yeah, a book. Oh, that's right, because you collab you have collaborators. I'm like, you yourself, you yourself and you? <laughs> no, <laughs> wow, no. impressive. I know, I know people that have done that. That that will exhaust you to the point of burning out. I do not recommend it. Um, but collaborating, yeah. So we just released a Ruins of the Galaxy book yesterday. Um, we, we have uh, the last Reaper 10, uh, Bastion of the Reaper coming out this Wednesday. And that one has been on pre-order for a while. Um, both of them had been. And then on next Sunday, we've got, I think potentially a, a new book, a new series one, you know, book coming out, but it might get pushed back a few days. And then the week after that, we have a third book and another series coming out. So like this whole month is, you know, it's already set up. Actually the release is set up for the next three months every Sunday because um, we just, you know, we like to plan ahead and we have so many collaborations going at this point. And then a lot of our series are ending right, like relatively soon. And we're, we've already started planning out the next um, collaborative series that we're going to be doing with those same authors. So a lot of planning involved for this stuff. And uh, we have someone who handles the newsletter and the, uh, the ads. Um, that's like her whole job. And, she does a newsletter, I think every, every release. And then she does a follow up like three days later for the unopens. She does, um, promotional stuff for audio. Anytime we put one of those out, um, anytime we do a sale, things like that, you know, and we also, we, I mean, we do swaps sometimes for people if we own, if we have favors and things. So, you know, those will go out. So, it, but at minimum, at minimum, every release. 
So it looks like you're all in with Amazon and, and Kindle Unlimited with your books. Has that always been the case? And do you have any tips for authors to kind of work that system and <laughs> get as many borrows as you can in addition to sales? Um, it's, it's tough because Kindle Unlimited is a blessing and a curse. I think we all know that. Um, it's really good for readers. Um, so I like it because I, I don't think I would have had the exposure that I had without it early on. Uh, but I wasn't always in KU. I was on, I was wide for a while because certain friends would tell me like, wide is the way to go and everything. So that's what I did when I started out and I didn't make much money. When I went into Kindle Unlimited, my income more than tripled, quadrupled, you know, uh, almost right away. And so with KU, I think when you release a book for the first three to six months, like it's really great. But then after that, when you put the ads on, um, a lot of people you're pulling from Facebook aren't necessarily going to buy KU. So or borrow in KU. So they're, they're probably going to purchase like a, like a normal book, like a three ninety nine, two ninety nine, ninety nine cent book. So you're going to see your page reads drop considerably. I would recommend going KU first and then going wide later. Um, once the series is done. And uh, for those who are curious, I know the answer to this, but I assume when you're doing collaborations and you're publishing with two authors, like everybody, every entity is like its own thing. Like you're not getting all-star bonuses necessarily for like four different yeah. things combined. Um, so any thoughts on that or on collaborating and, or versus just publishing your own stuff? Uh, collaborating is a lot of work. Um, uh, it's definitely not for everyone. Um, I enjoy the process because I have so many ideas, um, that I want to do. Um, uh, when I look at the market and I, and I, you know, I'm looking at like what's selling and, and these different subgenres and sci-fi and I'm like, Oh, well, I really have this idea that I want to push. Now's a good time to get this out, but I'm, I'm busy writing Renegade Star. Like, what am I going to do? Um, Hey Scott, do you want to work on this? Hey, you know, James, do you want to work on this? Um, that's a lot easier and it's more fun and I get a lot of out, out of it just from the creative process, the brainstorming process and all that. And I also like art design now. So coming up with covers is a fun process. But if you don't like that stuff and you just want to write books, collaborating, it's like another job. And the more people you bring on to do that, the more time gets sucked into that. So I write less than I used to, but I'm also able to be more creative than I used to. Um, I also spend more money than I used to. So I don't know. I think it's, it's, it's really dependent on your, your business model in this industry and what you want to achieve out of it. Because I am running a publisher now and as such um, it's a different business model than just being a writer. All right. Um, so I noticed you've got a sequence of books uh, on pre-order all the way to May. Uh, how do pre-orders factor in on your marketing tactics? Well, we do, we do uh, pre-orders now. We didn't used to because um, I wasn't a big fan of being locked into something. But um, Amazon lets you now push back a pre-order or change the pre-order date once, which is useful. We've done that. We had, had to do that a couple times. Um, but pre-orders are useful um, when you're trying to plan out your swaps and your promotions and things like that. So that's why we started using them. Um, our marketing person... It's very difficult for her to secure swaps and, and uh, features and things like that. These featured deals when you don't have a, a link, you know, so that's really the only reason why. If you want to get a bigger splash on day one, um, just by releasing to your list and your group or your, fo you know, your followers and things like that, then not having a pre-order will boost you higher in the store. And, you know, so there's, there's pros and cons to both, but at this point, pre-orders help a lot more. And you get that burst of money on day one, which is also useful. Yeah, I know that uh, in the past, uh, like, and it's hard because it's Amazon, it's hard for anybody to, to sort of nail it down. But it seemed like having a like the longer your pre-order was, the more spread out your, your, uh, your, you know, your sales were. And as a result, uh, the, the lower your, your release spike was. So I know a lot of people who depended upon huge releases really didn't like pre-orders. Meanwhile, yeah. especially if you're wide, uh, for a long time, you could be pre-ordered a much longer time wide than you could on Amazon. And it, I don't know, it ended up with an interesting balance between the two different methodologies. 
Yeah. Um, for a while, that was the, that was the philosophy that I think a lot of bigger authors adhered to was no pre-orders. Don't do them. Um, they're going to hurt your sales day one. They're going to hurt your rank in the store. Um, your overall exposure tail is going to be uh, shorter and maybe that's even still true. But, um, I think that, you know, depending on if you have the book ready to go in time and, and how much you want to spend on the launch and things like that, um, it can be really useful. I've talked to people who, like I know a guy who writes um, contemporary military, um, you know, war fiction and stuff like Jets and things like that. And he'll release a book in, the, in his series and he'll get $30,000 from the pre-order, you know, because he's created this funnel that just at the end of the book, he's got the pre-order link. And uh, at first I think he was only making a couple hundred dollars and then the sequel, he made a little bit more, but that funnel was growing bigger and bigger and bigger. The end of it, you know, with each release, because he always had that pre-order link in the back of that book. He also happens to write in a much, you know, uh, hungrier genre than I think a lot of us, you know, who write sci-fi and fantasy. But at the same time, you know, I think that's a very legitimate strategy and I've seen it work wonders for him. So, you know, you can use pre-orders really well and make a lot of money from them. Yeah. Um, let's see my, okay. So my next question is, um, just basically about you marketing and the authors that you work with. Um, what's the hardest part about marketing? Um, when it comes especially to, uh, working with other authors and being basically in charge of things. Um, and how do you overcome those hurdles? Um, well, we, you know, I mean, I've had, I've had collaborations fall apart because the author and I just didn't see eye to eye. And, um, like I'm the one, like the deals that the deal that I, I put forth with authors is if you're going to be a collaborator, um, I pay for everything. I pay for the cover. Our cover art is like a thousand to $1,200. Um, that's all covered by my take of the royalties, um, editing, even if it takes two or three passes, you know, I pay for it. Um, I pay for the formatting, I pay for the proofreading, I pay for the ads on it, and then I guarantee a certain ad spend after a certain number of books. And you, you don't have to pay for anything, you know? So all you have to do is write, and, um, and I get final say um, based on, you know, market research and what I think will make you the most money. And, um, like at the end of the day, that's my goal, right? As a publisher is to make you as much money as I can to get you in a place where you can take care of your family and you can, uh, you can feel comfortable enough to where you're, you don't have to go back and get your old job. Right. Which for a lot of our authors was a serious concern when they came on. Um, I will go close to the point where I'm not, I'm making almost no money if that's what it takes, you know? And the benefit to me is that I get to build this sci-fi readership, right? My, our, our email list grows, our Facebook group grows, so on and so forth. So it's an investment on my part either way. Um, but the agreement is that you listen to me if I try to, you know, help you with tropes and, you know, what I understand about the genre. Um, and some people have been extremely receptive to this, um, and very humble and, you know, easy to work with and cooperative. And other people just are like, you know, I have this vision that I, I want to write and it's not in line with this. So I'm going to go do that. And it's like, okay, you know, that more power to you. That's totally fine. Um, the people that you see us publishing, um, those are the people who have really enjoyed their experience and, um, we collaborate really well together. Like Scott Moon, you know, we're ending the Reaper series and we're going straight into a series called Orphan Wars um, after this. And, you know, he has, uh, he's done, it's been really easy to work with him. Same thing with Molly, same thing with Christopher Hopper, you know, um, uh, my buddy Rob who writes under, he's writing Soul Arbiter, so that's a pen name of his. Um, and, you know, Jonathan Yanez, same thing. So, I'm writing, writing two series right now with Jason Onspach. And, um, you know, he's a complete joy to work with. You know, very smart, very talented guy. So, 
you know, and like I said early on, like I like to write with my friends. I like to work with my friends and you know, I don't know there's, I, if I, if I didn't enjoy the process, I would probably just write myself and not bother with any of this stuff. It does seem that uh, to be do the publishing and collaborating takes a little different of a, I don't know if you would call yourself an extrovert, but uh, more willing and enjoying working with people where, you know, versus the solo writer that's like me <laughs> that just wants to stay in my cave and not really have to direct anyone. Um, yeah. Do you have any problems with um, like when you put your name on the book as one of the co-authors, do the, can the fans tell the difference at all? Or do they say like, oh, I like this combination, but not this one so much or anything like that? I mean, it, well, so here's the thing about what we do, right? And this is why um, I push uh, so much uh, as far as like the market and, and, and content to and tropes and stuff to, these, to the authors, the collaborators. I don't want to repeat myself when I'm putting a book out, right? So like, I don't want to just release another Renegade Star series that's just Renegade Star again, right? I don't want, like, we have Ruins of the Galaxy, which is sort of our Star Wars military sci-fi series. I don't want to do another Ruins of the Galaxy series. Um, I don't want to do another Last Reaper series about, you know, like the cyborg um, sort of Escape from New York type character. Uh, we've told that story, you know? Like, we've, we've done it. We don't want to do it again. Like, we just, we put out The Messenger. I think we're on book six or seven of that. And that's about a mech. Uh, it's a mech series. I don't want to do another one of those. Like, I want to do something else. So when we're collaborating with people, um, a big part of it is just finding new stories to tell that stand on their own and are totally unique and that draw new readers in while also satisfying the existing fan base who's grown to expect good quality and unique stories. Um, and yeah, we have people who... You know, they might read Soul Arbiter and that's their favorite book. You know, and they'll join the group. And the first thing that we ask in um, when you join is like, what's your favorite book that, uh, you know, from Jay and Chaney? And it's like, I've gotten Soul Arbiter. I've gotten Galactic Law. I've gotten The Last Reaper, Renegade Star, The Amber Project. Um, it's always different. And um, when you have, if you're going to do this kind of thing, you don't just want to, throw this like uh, a wide net with um with or not not a wide net you don't just want to stay in one lane in this genre that you're in you want to try and experiment and do all these different things based on what you think is going to do well because if i'm and like i said earlier i want these guys to make a lot of money right so i don't want them to copy another writer because that second series that's just like the last one's probably not going to make as much money because there's already a series like that and that story's already been told you know, um, so that, that part is a lot of work and it takes a lot of market research to see what people might be interested in um, and what's worth exploring. And while it doesn't always work out that well, a lot of times it does. But that's a big part of my job is like going and trying to understand how these guys um, can do well and uh, tell a story that they're both passionate about and that will maximize their ROI and return on investment. Um, for their time, you know, and the, and the word count we expect of them, which is now about 100,000 words per book. Got to get that KU page read money there. <laughs> it's not just that. It's not just that. It's audio too, you know, like mm -hmm. you don't want to put out an audio book that's five hours long. No one's going to buy it. And um, so do one that's 13 hours long, you know. So it's, we, we partnered with Podium for a lot of our stuff. But we also have stuff with Audible Studios. and. Uh, you know, Podium is so integrated now with our company that um, they're, they're in our Slack group. Like we have like the marketing team in our Slack group and, um, and we work really closely with them to get the right narrators for the, you know, for the right, for the right um, writers and, uh, and to hit, hit as many uh, listeners as possible. Um, and the longer the books are, the better the audio books are going to do based on, you know, based on their research. Right. Yeah. We had Jason Onspach on a couple of weeks ago and he said the same thing that uh, yeah. they were putting together two of his shorter books to make one audiobook. and those, you know, anybody using the credit system, that's a much better deal for them. Yeah. That's what they did for Renegade Star. Um, publisher packs, two books in one. And those, those are short books. They're 60,000 words each, you know? And so it, it works well for that story because they're serials, you know, essentially. Um, 
short, quick, fun stories. Um, but when we got away from that and we, we continue to expand, um, a lot of writers don't like to write that way. They like to write longer form fiction. And when we saw what was selling better, we went with longer form. So you mentioned a Facebook group a couple of times, and I saw that uh, J.N. Cheney's is it Renegade Renegade Readers has about 5,000 people. How much does that and Facebook overall play into your marketing? Um, it's big. It's a big part of it. Uh, newsletters, like I don't, I don't want to ever put all my eggs in one basket, so I won't say like, oh, like the Facebook group, that's definitively the thing, uh, because people used to say that about newsletters, and I, th I think newsletters have lost a lot of their, um, you know, effectiveness uh, with launches now, but I, I, they're still effective, but they're just one tool, right, out of your toolbox. So you also have your Facebook page, you have your Facebook group, you have you know any other, you have these promo sites and stuff. Um, and those are always changing and shifting around um, with what's more effective. And I'm sure there'll be a new thing in a year or two that's like better than all those things, like Insta Freebie was for a little bit. Um, but with the Facebook group, like you said, we have about 5,500 members now. Um, when I started investing in the company, um, two years ago, I think I had like 600 people in that group. And then I just, I decided I'm going to make this my priority. And so that's where all of the, you know, like the books direct people, um, the ads help some of the ads direct people. Um, and we're constantly making posts on the Facebook page to direct people there. And, you know, so it's just constantly growing and that has really helped us probably more than anything else. But if you just focus on one thing, even if it's, even if it's your newsletter, um, I think that's important. Now you mentioned uh, ads and uh, obviously you've got a, sh uh, a tremendous volume of books coming out. Uh, so do you depend upon the new book releases to provide most of your momentum or do you have sort of a maintenance advertising uh, uh, schedule that like sort of keeps the, the new reads coming in? Oh yeah, yeah. Um, man. We spend a lot on ads, um, but we also have a lot of writers and a lot of series. So a percentage of the profit that we get from each series goes back into ads for that series. Um, and like I said, for some of the lower earning ones, I just break even on that. And uh, but for the higher earner ones, obviously it's you know it's more profitable. But um, we have ads on right now the Messenger, Soul Arbiter. Renegade Star, The Amber Project, um, The Last Reaper, Ruins of the Galaxy, like all these different series, especially the longer ones, we have more money on those. And um, yeah, I don't know, we spend like probably five, six hundred dollars a day on ads, if I had to guess offhand. Five to six dollars a day? Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you have That's to remember, so much, big spenders. <laughs> yeah. You have to remember, like we have, um, I think collectively, like, close to 70 books now on the market. And um, so that's, when you look at it like that, it's easy to see. But uh, when it was just me and I was, I was writing on my own, I was spending probably half of that. So it's not just the ads anymore. It's also, like you said, all those book releases. So um, you said sift about 70 books on the market. Are, is your name on all of those? Uh, oof, yeah. I, so I was only talking about those when I said that. Um, if we want to so talk, cool. about, yeah, if we want to talk about pen name stuff. Um, oh, and pen name. My goodness. <laughs> no, if, if we want to talk about pen name stuff, that's another thirty books, I think. Nice. Yeah. Very but, very nice. I mean, we we haven't put anything out under pen names in a while, so those books, those were uh, from last. I think. Either the, either the year before last or early last year, we did a lot of that, just experimentation and, and things. Um, yeah, a lot of it, people experiment with erotica. That's what you're talking about, right? <laughs> right, yeah. Uh, <laughs> just kidding. No, well, you're not far off, actually. Um, no, but we did, we did do some stuff like that because I had a co-writer that was really interested in, uh, when we brought him on initially, he wanted to do that under a pen name. So I was like, all right, yeah, you know, I'll help you out. Let's, let's make this happen. So we put it through the same process 
we put this other stuff through, we did the covers, we did the editing. Um, and then after a while, that market began to get more and more oversaturated, you know, and I was over here building this platform for this publishing company for sci-fi. And I was like, do you want to come over here and write sci-fi with me? And that's what he did. Um, so those books continue to sell and earn, but we're not putting anything else out over there. It's entirely this genre now, but in the near future, we're going to be doing more stuff under other people's names without mine attached. See, this is really fasc fascinating. I mean, it's, it's one of the biggest positives and pluses of being an indie. You know, I mean, if you were a huge publishing house, you wouldn't be able to pivot like that, you know? Yeah, you really can't. I mean, publishing houses, uh, you know, you have like Random House and Tor and things like that, and they have billions of dollars, right? Or at least hundreds of millions of dollars to throw around um, and potentially lose millions. And we don't really have that kind of flexibility. So everything that we do has to be precision. You know, so like when I study the market um, and I'm looking, okay, what, you know, like, you know, Chris Fox always talks about writing the market. Um, that's essentially what we're doing all the time. But we're also factoring in um, personal fulfillment, which I think is very important. Yeah. Um, I had a phone call right before this with Christopher Hopper and we're talking about his next series because Ruins of the Galaxy is going to end at nine books. Uh, and he was like, I've got this idea for um, a series in my universe. And then I, I had just presented to him another concept that I thought would do really well in the market. And uh, we were trying to decide, well, what do you want more? Do you want just money or personal fulfillment or a mix of the two? And, um, you know, what's the balance that you need in your life right now? You know, because money is great, but that's not why I got into this business. So he and I talked about it for 45 minutes and we came to a conclusion that, you know, he wanted the mix. So we decided to fuse the ideas together and um, create something entirely different. And that's a collaboration, right? So um, he felt inspired and highly satisfied with the results. Um, and we'll see where that goes, you know, after he finishes Ruins of the Galaxy in a few months. Yeah, that's really awesome. Um, just a quick question that's not on the thing. Um, are you, I mean, how do, like if we have listeners that are like, oh, this sounds great. I love the genre. I mean, how do, how would they approach you or, or is it just you approaching people? I mean, how does that work? Well, typically in the past, um, like with Christopher Hopper, right? So he, he and I were friends first and same thing with Scott Moon. I went on Scott's podcast and talked to him on there. And then afterwards we uh, continued to talk and, uh, and I was like, Hey, I have this idea. Um, are you interested in writing it? And he said, yes. And that's where the last Reaper came from. Um, but with Christopher, uh, we were friends just casually on Facebook and we would talk and he would ask me for marketing tips and things. And, you know, we talk about life and, and everything like that and, and him becoming a full-time author, which he had yet to do. And so one day I was like, you know, if you're interested, you come work with me. Um, here's the deal that I give people and you, know, you can let me know what you think. And he was like, well, can I have the weekend to think about it? And I said, of course, you know, it's fine. And then he came back on Monday and he was like, you know, I think I'm going to do it. I'm going to take the plunge. And then like, I think two months after he started writing with me, he went full time and quit his old job. Uh, but that was traditionally how I would do things is like, I would just throw the idea out to somebody that I was friends with and say like, Hey, how do you feel about, you know, this idea? Do you want to write it together? Um, and of course I would go and read their work and see how I, you know, if I thought about it, I, I put their work through my editors and, and, and all the, on all that, uh, and get the approval there first. Now what I do is, um, if I don't know the person, I ask for a writing sample, you know, so like send me a writing sample and a list of ideas that you have for books. Like if the writing sample is good, I'll ask for the list, like give me three to five ideas that you are really passionate about, that you want to write, and we'll go, if, if there's at least one that's good, we'll go with the one that I think will be the best fit for you and my audience that I built. Um, because that will give you the best ROI in the long run. And, you know, sometimes it, sometimes it works and sometimes we can't come to an agreement on something and, you know, they'll do their thing. So I'm curious if you can answer a question that I get sometimes, because we were talking about Facebook earlier. And it sounds like you're pretty big on Facebook as one of your primary focuses, if not the only one. Um, 
you've got the group and the page. Should you have a group or a page as an author? Or it sounds like you're doing both. But um, what are the pros and cons there right now? Well, I also have an Instagram, right, with 25,000 uh, followers on that. And, um, you know, I invested a lot in that early on to build that up. Uh, but I think, and, you know, I think that's important. I get, I get readers from that, too. But my primary focus, like you said, I'm not on Twitter at all. Like, I have an account on there, but I'm never on it. Um, so if you tag me on Twitter, I won't see it until I log in like every couple of weeks. Um, but on Facebook, I'm on there every day. I'm talking to readers. I'm answering messages. Um, I'm in the group interacting, which again, like this is a lot of work. Okay. <laughs> I don't think, I don't think it's people quite understand that um, when you do this stuff there, I don't have a person that just goes in and like answers stuff like a lot of uh, big publishing houses. Um, we don't have anyone that does that. Like I do that myself and my co-writers, my collaborators do that when they, you know, they go in the group and they interact and they make, you know, videos and stuff and they stream. Um, but it's important in today's, um, in today's world because of social media to, you know, make your presence, uh, make yourself available to readers directly. And the Facebook group is a big part of that. It allows for that sort of direct conversation to take place and it allows other people to jump into that conversation. I think it's the same reason that YouTube has really like taken off um, because you can make a video and then you can have like conversations in those comment sections. Um, and I've seen like really big creators on YouTube with millions of subscribers still doing that. Um, and I think it creates that sort of loyalty with the, uh, with the viewer or in our case, the reader. But you, yeah, you asked about the Facebook page. Um, we have that and we have the group and we have the Instagram. And I think that while the focus is mostly the group, oh, we have the newsletter too. While the focus is the group, we also try to put a lot of time into these other things. So we have posts on the main page every single day, sometimes more than one. Um, you know, and people are constantly posting in the group at this point every day. And I try to give attention to Instagram, but it is like the bottom of the list of priorities. Have you found that um, with a group that it requires moderation? And it sounds like with your collaborators, you've kind of got automatic built-in administrators for the group, or do you do it all yourself? Uh, so I do a lot of it, but we have um, the collaborators, I think they're mods, but they, they have their own groups, you know, which I encourage. Um, but we, we, have a, we have a team, you know, and these are like the most engaged readers that have been around for like two years um, who are, we know they're capable and, you know, they're, they're eager and, and um, you know, kind people, you know, very rational uh, readers. So we have them in there as mods and then we have some of our staff, like both of my editors are moderators in there too. And, um, and my ads manager um, is also an administrator in there. So, you know, we, we have a fair amount of people. And the, the larger the group gets, the more people you have to have step in. Yeah, that's, I've kind of resisted it because I know it's a lot of work. To, or, or they start fighting and it gets a little chaotic in there. Yeah, yeah. But um, it does seem like you can maybe reach people more easily than with Facebook pages. You know, it's you can post those posts, but yeah. yeah. It's a lot of work. And um, I had to invest a lot of money last year in 2019 just to grow that group and to grow um, the readership as a whole, you know, with ads and, and um, you know, really book releases and things like that. Um, but as a publisher, I think that's sort of what you have to do because the larger the group gets um, and the larger the email list gets, the better we can launch these collaborations and these new, you know, these new series that we put out and things like that. But you can never really just rely on yourself for this sort of thing. Uh, you also want to make these uh, relate these business relationships with different companies, small companies, and also different writers, so that when you do email swaps and you do, you know, these promo site features, and you know, you you um, collaborate with someone like Podium or Audible Studios that you have these partnerships that are, uh, are going to, like they're going to help you with marketing and they're going to help you with reach. Um, and it sort of all works together, you know, like I could release books just to my audience and I do that a lot, but, um, 
every once in a while, I do like to sort of throw, throw the net out, so to speak. And, you know, hit up all my, all my colleagues and, um, business partners. And I just had a quick question too, since you mentioned Instagram and that you've got 20 some thousand followers there, have you found that useful at all for selling books or I know you can do ads yeah. there specifically to Instagram people now, but is it converting? I don't see, I don't, I don't do the ads. Um, I just post and, um, and I, I do find a lot of readers follow me on Instagram. Um, so if you're not, that's, that's the thing. That's why I was saying it's good to have like all these different outlets, um, to post your stuff to and to build them all up. Um, uh, because if I post in the Facebook group and Amazon suppresses the post or they just don't spread it out as much, then, you know, I boost a post to my page maybe they don't see either of those, even though they follow both, but they see the Instagram post or they see the email in their inbox or whatever it is, or they get multiple ones. Um, and they are reminded at 4 PM of a, of an email that went out at 7 AM, you know, and then they're like, Oh, I'm off of work now. I'll go buy this book that I was just reminded of again. So it's, you know, it all sort of factors into itself, um, and helps build the platform. Yeah, it's funny how uh, it often takes multiple touches to get anybody to actually click on something. And for a lot of people like myself, uh, you feel like you're pestering somebody when you start hitting up in different places. But it really it isn't pestering because so many of those people didn't see it in any of the other places. And you sort of catch them wherever their eyes are. It's a really hard lesson to learn. But Yeah, uh, exactly. Yeah. I had a, a question. You, we, you spoke about this a little bit earlier. You, uh, on collaborations, you you have like you have a lore librarian, basically. Yeah, we call uh, it we call her the lore master. Excellent. Um, uh, yeah, I'm gonna get her some business cards when twenty books rolls around. Top notch. I was just wondering, um, like, especially since you're collaborating and you have an expanded universe, which is why such a thing is really necessary. Like it, what's the process for sort of entering something into the canon? Like, is there, do you have to sort of be a gatekeeper and like, well, I don't know if we want to make that canon for the series. Like, how does it work? Uh, we just have like really set rules and we have a timeline of events for the universe. And as long as it falls into those and it doesn't seem like it won't work, like if, if she's looking at something and it's, it hasn't been defined yet, like as a yes or no type situation, like, oh, I want to invent this technology. Um, can I do that? And it's like, well, we've never talked about that technology before. We've never talked about that situation before. I got to go check with Jeff, right? Um, so that, com that comes up every once in a while. And, you know, if she ever has any qu any questions about hard science stuff, she goes to Rob, who's, you know, the guy that, early editor I had, you know, um, cause he's still heavily involved in that type of thing. So we have a lot of checks and balances in place to prevent, co you know, uh, contradictions and, uh, things that readers might find implausible in that particular universe. Have you ever had something like how much, how much crosstalk is there? Like, have you ever had something that somebody else entered into the canon show up in somebody else's stuff, like just become a, a, a staple of the series? Yeah, uh, well, The Last Reaper, you know, was meant to spin off and become its own thing and uh, involve new technology that we hadn't talked about in the universe, but it also piggybacked on existing stuff from the Renegade series. Um, but yeah, I mean, some of that stuff has been mentioned in other books, like the Reaper program, which is, you know, the, the cyborg program, um, which is largely defunct. And there's, you know, that's why it's called The Last Reaper. He's like one of the last ones left. Um, that technology has popped up in other series, you know, and there's a character in Resonance Sun, this like multi-billionaire character. Uh, he pops up in uh, the Galactic Law series. So there have been some overlaps and collaborative efforts to sort of intermingle certain characters and crossover technology and different things like that. But yeah, I mean, The Last Reaper is probably the biggest example because that's our second highest selling Renegade Star Universe series. So I have a couple of questions that are more towards um, like our listeners when it comes to marketing a little bit and then just advice from you to them. Um, so for newer authors just starting out, what sort of things should they have in place before they begin pushing hard at marketing? And then I'll ask my last question in just a bit. So when I started out, um, 
I was very eager to learn the marketing uh, side of things. I, I put out one book and I'm like, okay, now I got to market this book. Right. And that's like, I was very focused on that. I was taking all these classes and stuff. Um, someone told me who was earning six figures, you know, she was a, um, a young adult urban fantasy author. She said, um, and one of the most successful that I, I'd met at the time, uh, you know, just write your second book, focus on that. And that is still, I think the best advice you can give a new author is just write, write the next book, um, get a couple of books, at least like two, three, four, you know, out before you really start to turn around and, and get into the marketing stuff. Uh, because that is another job and learning it is another job. Learn, like spend, like I said, 70, 30, you know, um, spend some time on it, but most of your time should be going into writing the next book. Um, that other stuff's going to come in time, but when you put a new book out, Amazon's algorithm, you know, if you, if you hit it right, will advertise it for you. And at the very least, when you do market that first book, there's a second book for those readers to go jump into. Um, but if you start investing all your time early on into that first book, it's going to take you like it did me a year to write that second book when it would have only taken you a few months. Yeah, and that's that's really hard a lot of the time for newer authors to hear because when they release that book and it doesn't do well, which most first books don't, it's just really hard not to just, you know, hit the marketing and, you know, I'm a failure. Why aren't people buying my books? I really hoped that and I had these dreams and it's, yeah, I mean, they just need to remember, don't, I mean, don't stress, don't push yourself, don't expect too much and do just, I love that, you know, just keep writing and yeah, because things won't really take off until you've been doing it for a little while. Yeah, exactly. And um, it's experience and time, you know, um, and paying attention to like what works and what doesn't. Um, I know people who started out the same time I did and they're still not selling, um, but they're also not writing because they're spending all their time on like newsletter sequences and, and things like that. Just trying again and again and again to get like these little details right and fine tuning this or fine tuning that and the sequencing and, and all this stuff. And it's like, you know, if you just wrote, if you spent all that time writing that book, you'd have like 30 books out by now instead of five, yeah. you know? Yeah. And then for authors who are considering or wanting to um, quit their day jobs basically and be living on a full-time writing income, what sort of advice do you have for them? How will they, how do they know when they're ready and then how should they, handle it once they are? So the first thing I ask um, collaborators when they come to, to work with me is, um, what level of income do you need to go full time if they already have a job? Or what level of income do you need that will allow you to feel comfortable um, to do this, you know, like without having to worry about going and getting another job? And the answers always vary wildly. I've gotten answers that are like, oh, I need like $2,500 a month or to I need $8,000 a month. You know, it just depends because if you have a family of five and a mortgage and all these expenses, then you're going to need $8,000 a month. Um, especially if your job paid $8,000 before or does now currently. Um, but you have other people that live in small towns that don't have kids that might be older and, you know, they're retired and they're like, well, you know, I just need like two grand or whatever. Right. So yeah, your level of income, I would do a budget and factor in like, you know, expenses and, um, anything that if you have a family, like what is the cost of all that? Um, like I said, it can go all the way up to like 10, $12,000 depending on Like if you live in LA, I'm sure it's insanely expensive. Um, but once you have that worked out, just start working on books and trying to get to that first level of, uh, you know, your required income. If you're really dedicated, I'd tell you to move to a cheap uh, location and get a good deal on an apartment. <laughs> That's what I did. Um, and, and, you know, just don't spend any money and then work your ass off for, you know, that, that first year. Um, but it's hard. It's hard when you're starting out. Um, that's why, that's why a lot of these guys come to work with me because of, uh, you know, like that guaranteed audience is already there. Um, and they don't have to pay for all the investments and, and things like that. 
but I know that's not necessarily the, the best answer to give. Um, it's gotten a lot more difficult over the last couple of years. Um, so it takes more work to sell the same amount of books and to make the same amount of money. But if you're highly dedicated and you work hard and, um, and you enjoy the work, then I don't think that's necessarily going to deter, deter that person. Um, so, you know, you might have to make a couple of sacrifices along the way, but eventually it'll, it'll be worth it. And you mentioned that you were pretty conscious of the market and kind of trying to hit some of the tropes and stuff. So I think, you know, maybe you, you agree that if that is, if you do want to make money right away, that's probably not a bad way to go. All right. Well, Jeff, thank you so much for joining us for the last hour or, and, or so. <laughs> Where can people find you online and which book should they check out? You've got quite a few series out there now. Oh, I don't know. Well, like I said earlier, I mean, they all appeal to different audiences, um, you know, different targets and stuff. So I, I think if you're interested in me as an author and my writing, uh, check out The Variant Saga and Renegade Star. Um, I think one of my favorite books is probably Nameless, which is a, a prequel novel to Renegade Star about Abigail. Um, but as far as finding me, uh, you can look me up on Facebook uh, under Jay and Chaney. Um, add me uh, if you're an author or a, a reader and you just want to know, like you, you want to talk shop, you need advice or anything like that, specifically reach out and I'm more than happy to talk. Um, and you can also find me on Instagram. So yeah, there you go. All right, we do have a fairly decent sized audience now, so you may be getting <laughs> a few messages there. <laughs> uh, but thank you so much for um, being on the show with us, and thank you everyone for listening, and to Joshua Pearson for producing the show. You can find the show notes, and we'll put uh, links to Jay and Cheney's stuff and his pages uh, on the website at sixfigureauthors.com with the number six. And uh, if you have a comment or question, please feel free feel free to come by. And my dog just got up. So I guess it's time to end the show. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. See ya. So long, everybody. <laughs>